Does scapular dyskinesis matter? Can we measure scapular dyskinesis? And does it cause rotator cuff syndrome? I think the answer is yes. I think that there are some journals, like a new one by Matthias in the Journal of Clinical Medicine, that says, no, it's not a very reliable test. So here are my thoughts on why I think it matters and why I think it contributes to rotator cuff syndrome, even though it may not be a reliable test when it comes to research. Hi, this is Brandon Steele with Cairo, and I want to talk about this very specific test that I think is very important when it comes to the assessment and the treatment of rotator cuff syndrome. Because I think that if we can take a look at what the scapula does for stability, we can make an inference on what the shoulder, the elbow, and the hand are going to do in any kind of athletic activity. So today's blog is going to go over how to perform the test when it comes to research, and then possibly with our own spin, what we can do differently in practice to make a big difference in your patient education and also your clinical findings. So what is scapular dyskinesis? It's the, uh, the assertion that we have a problem with scapular movement or scapular position causing issues down the chain. We've all heard the term from Ben Kibler who developed the test, uh, Kibler and McClure, and they say that, hey, if we can improve the stability of the scapula, we can improve and have more mobility down the chain. So how do you do the scapular repositioning test when it comes to Matthias, if you look at um, uh, Kibler, it's the scapular retraction test. Can I borrow you, Ashley? So what we're gonna do with these patients is we're gonna have them standing, and we are going to attempt to affect the motion and also the position of the scapula using us. Essentially, I will be her serratus anterior and lower trap and having the ability to posteriorly tilt and externally rotate or upwardly rotate the scapula as she's going through a range of motion. For this test, what we're looking for is an increase in um, strength or a decrease in pain during this motion. And the motion that we're gonna test is the empty can position. The empty can position historically has looked at the supraspinatus, which is the most common rotator cuff uh, injured. However, we also know that between empty can and full can, there's really not that much difference in supraspinatus activation depending on the journals that you read. And I think that's one potential thing that we can exploit as we go at the very end of this blog. So what you're gonna have the patient do is go into full 90 degrees of flexion. They're gonna go into about 30 to 45 degrees of abduction with their thumb down in the empty cam position. What I'm gonna do as the provider is I'm gonna have my hand right across the spine of the scapula and I'm going to have my hand down, my forearm along the medial board of the scapula and cause a little bit of compression here uh, to force a little bit of stability. And I can actually test this before I do this and after. So what we're gonna do is back down and there's ways to test this with, uh, you know, for strength. So up here and out and I'm going to push down and does that cause any kind of pain? And also is there a, a loss of strength? And then we can test it with stability, which is when I'll be here and I'll uh, cause a little bit of compression in the same position and, and push down and test again. Uh, I think that's a very um, a good test when it comes to research. It's, very, uh, it's something that's very standardized and we can get some good information from. However, I also think that it could be a little bit better. Uh, so I wanna add in my own spin to the scapular retraction test that I think offers possibly a little more clinical information and also helps you and your patient understand their condition uh, perhaps a little bit more to increase their adherence to care so they know that you know what's going on and they can also feel what they need to do during their rehab and during their normal activities of daily living to help their shoulder pain. So here are my corrections or things that I would add to this test. First, I'd have them seated. We had a stool right around here, here it is. Imagine if you're standing and someone goes and pushes on you. Well, you need to use your postural muscles and you need to use uh, any kind of compensation uh, to prevent yourself from falling forward. So one, I don't think standing is a good way to test this. I think that if you're sitting, you're eliminating the lower kinetic chain and I think that you can actually put a little more force to the person so you can act as a scapular uh, stabilizer, that serratus anterior and lower trapezius. The second piece of that is the hand placement. Go ahead and try this on your next patient. Put your forearm across your medial border and their hand right here. You can't get a lot of force there. If you're gonna truly act as a scapular stabilizer, then do it. 
So what I'll do with my patients is I'll have my hand here. Now I'm not pushing down at all. What I'm doing is just having my hand here right across their clavicle. So I'm counteracting that force that I'm going to cause uh, in a P to A fashion. So I'll have my hand here and what you'll notice is I'm almost uh, letting her shoulder move. I I'm leaving some space here. And right along her medial border, which is right here, I'm going to have my palm and I'm going to create some posterior tilt. Now the important piece of this puzzle uh, comes into when you go to the gym, what do you see? Uh, you see people that kind of lock their shoulders into retraction and then do the exercise, whether it's a row or something like that. We need this, uh, the scapula to move. The scapula is designed to move. So even though I'm pushing down, I'm not blocking it there. I'm not forcing her to stay in that one position. So I will posteriorly tilt. However, I'm still allowing that scapula to upwardly rotate. And I think that's a big piece. Is so that posterior tilt, what has been shown is that when you do that, and in fact, you can do it by yourself right now, when you just contract that muscle a little bit, it actually opens up that subacromial space, helping with impingement, helping with a little bit of space, a little bit of decompression for that supraspinatus. The next piece, number three, which I think is by far the most important piece of this test, which is eliminated in the, uh, the test by Matthias, is looking at arm movement. Now, I understand in research you have to absolutely take uh, a certain number of variables and measure that. If you incorporate too many variables, uh, things can break down. However, when you look at rotator cuff tendinosis, and that's what they looked at in this study. They said they had to be above 18 years old. They had to have it for more than three months. So it's not a tendonitis at that point. It's got to be a tendinosis, actual damage done to that tissue. What we know is that tendinosis happens in predictable fashions. So they went and said they had a positive painful arc. They had a positive nears. Uh, I think it was an empty can, uh, a positive external rotation test, and Hawkins Kennedy. However, you have to test that shoulder in different ranges of motion. And the most activation you're gonna get out of the supraspinatus is actually about maybe 20, 22 degrees of flexion and abduction. So the most activation you get from that muscle is actually right in this area, not way up in this area. Yes, you'll get more pinching once you get up to that area, which is why we have our painful arc test. However, test it in all those ranges of motion. So what I'll tell my patients is, Ashley, what I'd like for you to do is to keep your elbow straight. I'd like your thumb down, and Ashley doesn't have any shoulder pain, at least yet. Um, and I'm going to have her slowly pick up her arm and stop whenever it causes pain. Now, most people are going to stop once they hit that 60, 90, maybe 120 degrees, because that's why they're coming in to see you. Um, but if you only test it at one range, you're not getting those different arcs of motion. You're not putting tension across that muscle or tendon unit to actually influence that pain response. So I think testing in all those ranges is an important piece. And the reason we do that for this test is we're gonna have her slowly come up and let's just say that it hurts right here at 90 degrees. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have my hand here causing a little bit of support, making her feel nice and stable. And I'm gonna have my hand right across here acting as a serratus anterior and lower trapezius and I'm pushing down, and now I can have her slowly do that motion again and see how high she can go uh, without having pain. When you do this in practice, what you're gonna find is that that pain is going to disappear if the scapula is related to the shoulder problem. This happens over and over again in practice, and we teach it in the diplomate classes, is that we, when we perform this test, it gives us good clinical information. If I know that if with posterior tilt and scapular stability, that I can get her shoulder pain to go away instantly, where should my rehab process go? My mind says, hey, I need to incorporate some activities in here to build up some strength, but also the number one piece of this is the patient education piece. Ashley now knows that when I pick my arm up and it hurts, I have a tool, I have a movement pattern that can help get this pain to go away. So what am I gonna teach Ashley? It's what Ben Kibler calls the scapular repositioning test, is when he's gonna go through and say, there's not an actual muscle here, but we're gonna say, Ashley, uh, there's a muscle between my fingers. Uh, there's a, the, right here, the inferior pole of the scapula. I want you to contract that muscle about 10 to 15% of your force. So she's bringing that down. And that might be a little bit too much and relax. And it's a little bit right there, 10, 15%. And then what I have Ashley do, 
hold that contraction and now slowly pick your arm up again and see if that pain gets better. A lot of times it's going to be better, but not quite gone. There's of course a ton more stability when I can get in here and I can cause that, um, that posterior tilt and I can help her with that upward rotation. So doing the scapular repositioning test defined by Kibler uh, is a good patient um, education tool and something you can send the patient home with because now they understand that their scapula is contributing, maybe not causing, their shoulder pain. We're all about causation and correlation in our profession. Make sure you understand the difference and make sure you understand that when someone something is correlated, that we can address that with the patient. The last thing I wanna cover is the extreme importance of this joint. This joint is my favorite joint to treat uh, because it's not really a joint, the scapular thoracic joint. We can change its position. We can change its mechanics uh, just with using the patient's head and are exploiting that mechanics of that shoulder so we can make sure we can have an understanding of where to go with the rehab. Uh, thanks for listening. This is by far one of the most passionate things that I, that I talk about, that I teach about, is the shoulder. Because I think a lot of people take a very isolated approach. In fact, if we looked at that paper and we said, yeah, you know, I'm not going to use this test anymore. If I just looked at the abstract, I wouldn't get the full uh, experience of the paper. They looked only at the supraspinatus. Well, what if there's a problem with the infraspinatus, uh, arteries minor, or subscapularis causing their shoulder pain? All of them can present with that uh, anterior lateral shoulder pain. We need to make sure we do a full exam, and just like every other orthopedic test, we use it in a clinical prediction rule, that this test is a piece of the puzzle. It's not A plus B equals C, it's A through F equals C. And we have to make sure that we're really looking at all the tests that we could perform on a patient. And then, most importantly, empower the patient to get rid of their own pain. And we're there to help coach them through it. Thanks for listening. And I hope you'll, uh, you'll meet me at the ACC RAC conference in San Diego. Uh, hopefully we get to meet up with a, bu a bunch of colleges and also researchers, which are the heart of what we do as chiropractic. If we're going to change where our profession is going, it's going to be through big data. And we're just honored to be a pro part of that process.